Uh, well, dear colleagues, I don't know if you were awake for this presentation, but if you were awake, I don't think um, you would have found this a very comfortable presentation. Uh, some of it is lovely, you know, love and caring and so on, but the idea of the corporation being a psychopath and needing to be reformed, civilized, cured or something like that, uh, I don't know how you found it. I found it quite uncomfortable to think through. Um, so, perhaps you can have questions straight away. I see a hand here, and please, and I see, are there some hands in the back? Oh, yes, please, go ahead. Do it. Uh, Maya Wendland, HEC Lausanne. I wonder how you define love. I would say some people could define it not as psychopathy, but uh, complementary neurosis. Yes, uh, that's uh, actually a really good question for people when you go into businesses to help them define what we mean by love. And it's a power word, so it's a word that I use deliberately to unsettle business leaders because it's so powerful, it really does unsettle them. And then we help to define what that means. And it's obviously less about eros in the workplace, it's less about desire, um, although obviously some wonderful marriages have happened uh, from the workplace. Uh, it's more about... Um, uh, philos and agape, if I can use the Greek here. It's about empathy. So um, empathy, uh, as I was suggesting, uh, love in that sense is part of what makes us who we are. And we're not unique, I don't believe, as a species. We can see empathic behaviours in other species. But we seem to have lost it in the corporation. I would add one health warning here, which is that I think we're all fixated on the joint stock corporation. We need to remember that uh, the vast majority of human beings work in small family businesses uh, trying to earn a living. Uh, even in the e EU here, which is part of the uh, developed world, 92% of people work in SMEs, not in big corporations. And I think that if you look at that, you can actually see that almost by definition, the family business is and has to be built on empathy and trust. Uh, the sort of categorization that Roger was using is, uh, in my reading, best explored in C.S. Lewis's book, The Four Loves, where he talks about the different kinds of love, um, going back to the Greek words involved, which is, of course, what you've been using. I had the second question at the back. Yes, Bernie, my other name. Um, you've uh, drawn a picture of us, how we get molded from our environment uh, through our childhood and old stages. Um, what about our conscience in the end, and how does it affect what we are doing? Is it all that uh, it is external influences or what comes from the inside from us? Uh, th thank you, yes. Well, I'm, I'm, if I gave the impression I think it's all environmental, it's not. Um, I, I think that we are soft-wired for empathy. I think that we are clearly built for reason. But I think what's crucial is creating the right learning environment for us as human beings beginning from the day where we are born. Um, and I'm, uh, I guess I'm happiest with the old, you know, the old saying that we're a product of nature and nurture. It has to be both. So I think there's some things we are soft-wired with. Um, and I'm going back to, I think, a presentation we had yesterday afternoon, which shows how malleable the brain can be. We had that presentation around uh, mirror neurons. And in fact, we know that we can reprogram the brain even at the physical level, not just at the um, uh, chemical level. Um, and so I'm a great believer that it's, uh, we are born. Um, innocence is a, a word that's used in, in the religious context, which to me means having no ability to discern right from wrong. But I think that if we are given love and a good education, which we were talking about in our discussion group earlier, then that helps us to build that, that sense of morality. I hope that answered your question. In fact, human beings are born without any sense of taste as you may have realized if you have tasted baby food. And the interesting, <laughs> the interesting thing is that some human beings, like me, grew up to love Indian food, which is relatively hot. <laughs> and others grew up to love fairly bland food, or Mexican-type food, or African-type food. So even in that, our brains get programmed, isn't it, Roger? Uh, other questions, please. I have a hand at the back yeah. over there, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you yes. very much for this discourse that I loved. Um, I, I use a lot of love in my, in my teaching, and um, my experience is that self-love always comes after love for others. 
do you have the same experience and do you understand that? Because it seems very strong, but I'm, I'm, not under, I mean, I'm interested in your point of view about self-love. I, I'm not sure I've got a conclusion one way or the other. I, I think it's work in progress. Um, how important is that? I don't know, as long as it works. Good. Next question over there. I saw a hand. Uh, is that Guido again? Yes. yes Hello, Guido. Hello. Um, you make a very strong link between behavior and the level of moral development. Mm -hmm. We know from research in psychology that a lot of things we do comes from the context in which we act. Yeah. So genocide, um, Abu Ghraib, all these uh, events mm -hmm. happened because people who had values and integrity participated in the harm doing. Yeah. So how do you build this into your model? Okay, um, that's, that part of the model is where I talk about social learning and social decision making. So the context is we have our own personal character and mechanism for making judgments but by definition, human moral communities are collective. And I think when the collective goes off course for all sorts of environmental reasons, you can actually have temporary insanity and obscenity in terms of the behaviors of those groups. So, which is why I'm, I'm relying on family friendship and local community being a better case study for what works, even though they are all imperfect, than, um, for example, the modern corporation, which is what, only two or three hundred years old and its current form is probably just post-war. Good, and another question at the back. Uh, is that Jakob again? Now yeah. clearly corporations are legal political constructs. So do you have any idea how, what um, are the main policy changes we need to make sure that we create uh, corporate Switzerland's instead of corporate North Korea's? I mean, is it just the issue of uh, do we need to restrict a, a limited legal liability or are there also other issues? Um, okay, I think there will be a Darwinian evolution if the corporation really is so um, corrupt, it will die out. But in the meantime, yes, I agree with you that we need to redefine personal responsibility in the corporation. And it's interesting how few leaders of the failed banks having to really make a, account for and compensate for their actions. Uh, you know, take blame and ask for forgiveness, uh, receive punishment and so on. I mean, not many people who are leading banks are uh, actually doing the perp walk to jail. Um, the other part of my answer is to uh, look at the power of mutualism and localism, the, the energy that social entrepreneurships that the uh, well-being and the common good created by social, social enterprises and not-for-profits I think is very powerful. Um, I think that, so my answer is I think we do need some legislative changes. Uh, having said that I think regulation is a very bad thing uh, in, in an excess. Um, for me, the failure in the banking crisis was the failure to actually enforce the existing regulations. Um, I'm going off piece a bit. Can no, I just, 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 say, just say one thing about the banking yeah. crisis? There is a definition of fraud, which is, means to, to make financial advantage through deception. And to me, the whole banking crisis is the biggest fraud in human history. And I, I don't see anyone being prosecuted for fraud, pecuniary advantage through deception. Roger, we, we were talking earlier about another corporation you're working with, which will remain nameless, of course, mm. uh, as it did during our conversation. But I found it quite helpful. Would, would you like to just say, we've got a few minutes, would you like yes. to just say a little bit about that? Yes, I, I can't name them. I can't even give you their sector because it would um, help to identify them. But um, this corporation has been in a very dark place over the last few years. And it, it's only when it got so dark, so the darkness we have just before dawn, they suddenly realized that the answer, one of the answers to um, switching the lights back on was... Uh, to realize that um, the mistakes they were making were nothing to do with um, their economic model or their technology. It was to do with the fact that they had removed human judgment and empathy from the workplace. That people were acting as automatons, but actually failing to do that job because we're not automatons and we can't do things by the book. And automatons, so, you mean like robots? Or? Like, like robots, just following instructions. And because they were following instructions like robots, when something happened that wasn't in the instruction manual, 
They just didn't know how to deal with it because there was no process for them to follow, which is the point that I made in the graph there around moral development, which is that as we grow as human beings, we develop the capacity for judgment and we don't need others to tell us what to do. And it's a remarkable journey that this organisation has started, but it needed the change at the top, Prabhu, which is maybe what you suggested. And we've moved from an egocentric, arrogant leadership to one which truly is humble. I mean, they have been humiliated, mm. but they are now truly humble and beginning to understand the power of that humility in terms of how they rebuild their business. So the question that arises for me, Roger, is the following. If most corporations are led by egotistical um, leaders, which is, according to your research, the case, uh, is it really right that they would have to run into major disasters, either personally, of course, or as corporations, before they come to the conclusion, having been hurt, mm. that actually we do need to be humble, we do need to learn? Well, it, it's interesting. That's a great question, Prabhu, because what we're seeing is that the, the, corp well, the stakeholders in the corporation, so the, sh the stockholders, the customers, the employees, wider society are paying the price, but in fact, the leaders aren't. The leaders, as we said earlier, are walking away. They've got a get-out-of-jail card and they've got a big bag of loot on their back. They are not accountable. They privatise the profits and socialise the losses. And there is no personal accountability. And I think that if we make them more personally accountable, uh, you know, if you're dealing with sociopathic behaviour, one of the only ways you can actually control them is to revert back to the ethic of obedience and say, if you do the wrong thing, you're going to have to pay the consequences. Uh, Henri-Claude de Bessinier. Yeah, you, you mentioned that a corporation has no conscience. Uh, I would object to this. I think a corporation does have a conscience. I have seen corporations, particularly in China recently, where it seems that the uh, conscience was a bit lacking. And I have seen some corporations where, thanks to the values of the CEO, thanks to the culture of the organization, you could see that there was a conscience. Mm. And to think that co uh, conscience is only an attribute of the individual, but not the organization, I would disagree with that. I think both can have a conscience and make it explicit through their behavior. All right. Uh, just seconds. before you answer that, can I just see a show of hands? Anybody else wants to ask a question or say something? I see two hands, Pierre, and I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Please. Maybe you want to go first Hi. and then Pierre. Thank you. Hi, Roger. Uh, I'm Anis Bukli. Hi. Uh, two questions. First one is, uh, you know, you're going to be uh, doing an assessment for the two organizations, HSBC and the dark one. What will be the subject you'll be covering in the, these two days? Uh, That's one point. And yeah. the second, at the same time, what are your, if I, you allow me, what are your personal expectations at the end of these two days on, uh, on humanizing these, pe these people? Great questions, both of them. Pierre, and then yeah. I'll ask you to sum up very quickly. <laughs> It, it seems to me in, in your hard critics uh, toward the, the immorality of the, the companies that you put just everyone in the same bath. Uh, in the same sector, you, you, can, you can know that there are people behaving like bastards and people behaving consistently in the long way with a very, value, with a very strong value-driven organization. Uh, if you take books uh, like uh, Jim Collins, uh, uh, Good to Greet, and so on, uh, you have some uh, uh, evidence and demonstration that uh, uh, companies which are really connected to deep values on the long term and implementing in a coherent way these deep values are often companies very successful. Are they places, uh, uh, I will say, similar to North Korea? Thank you. I Roger, answer, you have I shall, one minute and 20 seconds. I shall answer the first and the third questions together because they're linked. I'm very, very precise that the legal concept of the corporation, which is a person in law, by definition cannot have a soul. It is a, me it is a participant in our judicial system, and yet it has no soul. It cannot swear on the Bible. It has no body to incarcerate. It has no soul to damn. Therefore, that is why I believe the corporation and the duty of directors to the well-being of the corporation is morally corrupt. It is, in a Jewish faith would call it a golem. It is a, a, a being with no soul. And to answer the, the third question... 40 seconds. The, all corporations aren't bad, 
The corporation itself is a morally corrupt construct, but human beings, and I've shared with you one corporation, the human beings in one corporation, who are trying to do something about it. So the answer to the third question is you have to transcend the corrupt nature of the corporation as a legal construct. To answer the second section in 22, 21 uh, seconds, the way we do this is to give people an insight into who they really are through a, this two-day event, which begins with holding up a mirror to them as individuals and to the corporation about their moral character, to get them to experience the fact that everybody in the room actually, unless they're a functioning psychopath, has empathy, and to get them to unite around that. Believe me, the energy and the, uh, uh, and the emotion that comes into the room is profound, and it's a step change, it's a, tra a huge transition and transformation in there in, when you work with those groups. But you need two days. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed to Roger. Excellent talk, very comfortable. Thank you very much. Thank you.